This show was made by the Big Noggins at Sesame Workshop. say to his dentist? I don't know what. Tuscaloosa. <laughs> <laughs> Why does the elephant keep putting that dust on his back? Elephants have very sensitive skin. It has a lot of blood vessels and a lot of nerves in it. And they put dust and dirt on their backs to protect them from the insects and from the sun. So how do you know all this? I'm a scientist, and I study evolution. Evolution? Evolution is the process that affects animal shapes and forms through time. How these animals adapt to their environments. If you can make out this elephant over here on the left, you'll see that it's just got really massive and sturdy legs. Mm -hmm. That's so it can support its overall body weight. As a matter of fact, they're the largest of the land mammals and are at the upper limits of their size. What do you mean by upper limits? If they were too much larger, they wouldn't be able to support their own weight and walk around. One of the things that helps them is the fact that they have cushions or pads in their feet, and the bones in their legs are very, very strong. They look like columns that hold them up. Yes, that's a similar uh, principle. There is another mammal in the ocean, the blue whale, which is a lot larger in size, but it uses water to support its own weight, whereas elephants have to use large and sturdy legs. And also, it's got the distinguishing features of mammals. It has hair. That's one thing that you can recognize a mammal by. I don't see any hair on all these elephants. Well, if you look very closely at the back of the elephants, you can see the hair there, and also at the end of its tail. He's picking up all that hay and stuffing it in his mouth. The elephant's trunk, not only is it the animal's nose, it's sometimes used like a hand and they feed themselves with it. And it's also used for smelling or, or touching other animals in the herd. And sometimes elephants use their trunks for spraying themselves or, or their young. Hey, I've got another elephant, Joe. How can you tell if there's been an elephant in your refrigerator? I don't know. You can see his footprints in the cream cheese. <laughs> gravity pulls things down. You all know that. But gravity influences things that go up, too. Like trees. I'm at a logging camp in North Fork, California. And that's Becky Robertson. She works here. She's a forester. That's a scientist who studies trees. Here, let me just get this stuff stuck in. I'll give you your hard hat and we can take off. Are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Great. Here you go. Okay. I have to wear this? Yeah, you have to wear that. Okay. Becky, how come all these trees are shaped so many different ways? Well, they're all different types of trees. Basically, the same reason that different people look different, it's genetics. It's the way they've developed through time. Becky, what does a forester do? Gosh, they do lots of different things. They measure trees. There's a lot of thinking that goes into which trees are cut down and which stay. What Ideally, what we want is the best trees left on the area to grow more. Well, what are we going to do today? Well, we'll go up and we'll measure some trees. I'll show you how we measure trees. Mm -hmm. And then we'll decide on some trees to mark. And then we'll mark them and then we can go see some of the logging. Oh, okay.
did it take you a real long time to learn how to identify all the different trees and leaves and stuff like that? No, no, it doesn't. It's just repetitive. You just look at them again and again. You could even start in your own backyard and find out what kind of trees are in your backyard. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon you'll start recognizing those trees on the city street here and there. And that must be fun. I yeah. Guess. Becky, what is wrong with this tree? <laughs> Why is it shaped like that? It changed its shape because there was no light on this side. Look at the little stobs of the limbs sticking out, and then you see the dead limb up there. These sugar pines have shaded that side, and the, the, the limbs have died back. So all the, the live limbs are on one side now. There's no live limbs on the other side. So because of light, sometimes you can get a bent over shape, or if something's shaded, you can get a shape like this. The sun is kind of driving factor to, for trees to grow. You'll find that as you look around the woods, you'll probably see lots of trees bending a little bit, trying to get more sun. So, do trees grow up because they're all looking for the light? Well, that's one of the reasons, but there's another, and it's probably more important, but it's invisible. Most people can't see it. Well, what's that? It's gravity. Gravity? I, th I thought that gravity made things stay down. You know, gravity holds us on the ground. I don't understand why the tree goes up. Well, it's caused by hormones. The hormones regulate the growth. Hormones are chemicals. They're in the human body. They're in trees and other plants. And the hormones in the roots cause it to grow down. Mm -hmm. The hormones in the stem cause it to grow up. Look at this tree. It's been knocked down. This big tree fell over it, and it knocked down and curved it down. It grew horizontal to the ground. And then look over here. Look at the way it's starting to curve back up here, coming up straight right here with a response to gravity, coming back up in the air. This will continue to grow up. See, these are starting to grow straight up especially this one coming out from the bottom and coming straight up again. What had happened in about 15 years, these look like a bunch of little Christmas trees growing straight up. Oh, that's neat. Again, the response to gravity. If the sun were on our left, and that, if that was south, then wouldn't these trees on this hill be growing that way? If they only responded to the sun, but they respond to gravity, so you can see they're growing straight up and down, oh, right. regardless of the hill they are on. So even though the hill is slant, the trees go straight up. Right. How tall do you think this tree is? I think it's about 100 feet tall. OK. Stick the nail real hard in the bark. Ah, hurts your thumb, doesn't it? Yeah, I got it. OK, now you walk back until you get 50 feet away from the tree. How many feet are you? Oh, uh, 35. All righty, 15 more feet. Right here, stop. Oh, right there with the black line? All right, now pull it tight. Make sure that's how far you are. Okay, we'll use this instrument to measure the height. It's a relescope. Okay, it start at the bottom? Right. Start at the bottom and, and read the number down there. Okay. 15. Okay, remember that number and keep the break in and go all the way to the top of the tree and read the number at the top of the tree. Okay, so you add those two numbers together, mm -hmm. get 214, and because we're at 50 feet, you divide them by two. 107? Right, that's how tall that tree is. Gee, so you don't have to climb it after all, mm -hmm. huh? Nope, just these instruments, that's all you need. I've never seen anybody chop a tree. It's pretty neat. Do they say timber? No, no, but they yell, so everybody knows they're cutting down a tree. There's a, another way that gravity plays a role here, and we can figure that one out. Well, you mean like what goes up must come down? Well, not only that, as you see here, the tree's leaning. And if it leans one way, we'll need to compensate with the cut to make it fall. The fallers probably have already figured that out, but you and I can do that. Well, how do you do it? I've got this little plumb bob here. And you and I can stand up next to it and just see how it's leaning. The plumb bob goes straight up and down like the force of gravity. Oh, OK. And the tree leans that way. Right. And they can do that without this? Yeah. An experienced smart. followers. <laughs> yeah, they're smart. <laughs>
need to make a house? You need ten this size to make a house. Yeah? Uh -huh. That is a lot of wood. Sure is. What's on Noggin? Well, right now, you're watching 321 Contact. And coming up next, it's Square One TV. Well, my little math fans. After that, stick around for Nick News. So now you know what's going on. On Noggin. Collaborator here. With some 411. That means information. Now you can see other polling results right here on TV. Wow! Every day, you can go to the hubbub at noggin.com to vote. Then, I count up the votes and give you live results every weeknight during each hubbub show. Why? Because... FYI, you are a B I B. You see? I see too. Uh-oh, too many acronyms. I cannot help myself. See you later. Goodbye. That's all. What sparks you? You like baseball music. I love dance. Very comical. I like baseball. What sparks you? I give me photography. Basketball. Cool. What sparks you? I like soccer because um, I it, it's fun to play and I really like playing with my friends. On my soccer team, we don't usually. I mean, we weren't very good team, so I never really scored goals. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but if I, when I play with my friends in school, I want to score a goal, it, it feels really good, and then everyone, like, looks up here and say, okay, you gave us a point, and now, now, like, we like you. <laughs> what sparks you? Now back to 321 Contact on Noggin. Hey, Miguel. Yeah? What kind of bridge is that? It's a suspension bridge. Oh. What's it suspended from? Those two towers, I guess. Maybe Jackie knows. She talked to someone at the Golden Gate. A construction engineer. Marvell Allen. And then also in the other cables that are on the other side. Now, this is just part of this section here, okay? But never mind this, Jackie. I have to go out in the field and do some inspecting anyway. Why don't you just come along with me? We'll change clothes and get our gear and go on out, okay? I like that. Great. Can I ask you something? Sure, Jackie. How does that stay out? That's a good question. Let's use your safety harness as an example, okay? We're going to pretend that these are suspender ropes. And if you notice on the real bridge, there's lots of suspender ropes that are holding up the roadway, okay? They look like the strings on a harp. We're going to pretend that this part of your safety harness is the cable. The same way that you see there, the cable that is U-shaped, okay? Okay. U are the tower, the same as that tower out there, the vertical. I'm the tower. I'm the tower on uh -huh. this side. Okay. okay. And then we're going to pretend that our drawing case is the roadway. The suspender ropes hold up the roadway, but so does the cable. The suspender ropes are pulling down, and they are supporting the roadway. Now, uh -huh. what's happening to us, the towers? Down. We're being compressed downward. The reason? We've got more cable that goes over our head and out the other side. And that weight of the cable, the weight of the suspender ropes, and the weight of the roadway is pushing us the towers downward. We've got more cable out here, and that we use to anchor us, keeps everything steady and pulled. And this is where my tension comes in. Notice the roadway is held up. You're pulling on your end, that's tension. Now, if we didn't have this extra cable here, I would start to fall in towards you, and you would fall in toward me. And the roadway road wouldn't would be, be held up. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. We'd all so. be in the water. Right. Does that Where give you an idea how it works? It, it really does. Okay, now we're going to go over and I'll show you some of the other things that I have to do during the day when I inspect. Let's go do them. Okay. The 
wind affects the bridge, the amount of cars that go over the roadway in terms of the little the bit weight. of movement, it, their weight affects it. Also fog, which brings in a lot of salt air, and one of the important things that affects the bridge is corrosion. We are very much concerned with corrosion on the bridge, so we paint constantly to make sure that the sections are all new and are not going to be affected by corrosion. Do they ever, does this ever fall, like all these? Oh, these are rock. Yeah. Okay, now this What's is the this? rivet. This is one of the original rivets, and you can see. Did this just fall off? No, it didn't just fall off. We have a program where we continually put in new bolts to replace the rivets that have gotten old. Oh, but you mean it didn't just come no, off? No, oh, no, no, it didn't. Has Sometimes there worse. are sections that do fall off. We keep painting so that they'll stay this way. How so often do you paint? We usually paint every day. They go from one end of the bridge to the right. other and until they finish, inside and out, to make sure that salt and corrosion does not affect the metal. That's very important. So we have to paint the underside, all these structures you see here, and the overside. So now where are we going? Well, now you've seen some of the things that I do as far as inspecting on the bottom. And we'll go right up to the top. How far up? It's about 700 feet all the way to the top. Okay? Let's go. Ostriches are really big. Some of them get up to about 300 pounds or so. Do they fly? No, they've evolved beyond the capacity of their wings to carry them in the air. So it's had to adapt to movement on the ground. And to protect itself, it's developed long, powerful legs. They can run very, very fast. About how fast? Clocked at about 30 miles an hour or so. It's got very big size. Look at that. Elephants are the largest land mammal. Ostriches are the largest birds. Ostriches don't make a nest proper. <laughs> Usually they will just make a depression in the sand and place their eggs there. As you can see, they're pretty large and they correspond to the, the size of the ostrich. Now, if this bird happens to be 300 pounds, how can he sit on these eggs? Well, that's one of the unique features of the egg. 
its shape adds to its strength. It's a lot like an arch in that when you push down on an arch, it's a very, very strong structure. But if you push up into an arch, it readily collapses. And that helps protect the, the young ostrich from predators or the weight of its parents' body. Well, so that's what makes it so easy for the bird to get out, but not for his parents to break it or for predators to get in. Exactly, exactly. Oh, I see. It's very heavy. They weigh about three pounds a piece. When each one of these hatches, each young ostrich will be about a foot high. And then, well, we'll start on its own life. It's hard to believe that a bird this big came out of a three-pound egg. Whenever there's trouble, when there are the double, we're the bloodhound gang. If you've got the crime, we've got the time, we're the bloodhound gang. Billy Chatterton's dad is about to hire someone to toughen Billy up. Billy's mom calls in the gang to investigate this woman calling herself the Little Georgia Magnet. At Billy's house, they see a demonstration of her $100 a bottle magnetized water. She has Billy try to break an egg. He can't, but after drinking one sip, Take this! He can knock Ricardo's fists apart. The woman herself is so strong, Ricardo can't separate her fingers and has such magnetic attachment to the floor that Billy's dad can't lift her up. He's convinced. And as Vicky tries to figure out the trick, he hands over his check. Ricardo, see if you can find out how the egg trick was done by calling your magician friend. Maybe it was a wooden egg. She wouldn't be caught with evidence like that. Turn around. Hello, Abaddon. This is Ricardo. Like Look, Wiz, we're on a cage. A fake strong Close woman from head. Georgia. Yeah, she pulls that trick where you can't crush an egg. Yeah, the little Georgia magnet. How'd you know her name? What do you expect? Well, she's alive. I don't care what the Neither book says. She. Okay, thanks. She's been pulling those tricks. Are you ready for this? The little Georgia magnet is dead. She was big stuff in the 1890s. Magicians know all about her strong woman tricks. Avedon says they were exposed in a book by another Georgia strong woman named Lulu Hurst. It may be in the library. Ricardo, check police headquarters for a mugshot. Confidence woman, get rich quick faith healers. I bet we're dealing with a real pro. I'll check the library. What about me? Magnetize yourself to that phone. Call Billy. Make sure the little Georgia magnet hasn't skipped yet. I'll check back here and then meet you there. Gotcha. Hello, Mrs. Chatterton? Hi. Uh, can I speak to Billy, please? Hello, Billy? Thank you this is so Skip. much, little magnet. I've enjoyed meeting you. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. Hector, we have something to show you. I ain't given another demonstration. No, we are. Mr. Chatterton, this woman is no more magnetized than I am, and no stronger. She's skipping out with your check. I don't have to stand here and take a bad mouthing from this young one. Sit down. Ricardo, the egg trick. The real trick is getting everyone to believe that Billy was so weak he couldn't break an egg. Held this way. That's the trick. End to end, the structure of an egg is so strong, it can withstand an unbelievable amount of pressure. You need fingers like a vice to crush it. Skip the fingertip trick. Care to pull apart Skip's fingers? No, of course not. You know, it's just a trick of leverage. Skip is concentrating all the strength of his chest and arm muscles at his fingertips. Magnetized water has nothing to do with it. I don't go in for them cheap tricks. My stuff's the real thing. Mr. Chatterton, the fist trick. If you hold your fist together as hard as you can, Billy will knock them apart without drinking magnetized water. Me? You won't believe your own strength. Is it okay, Dad? I did it! That's 
because muscles can work in only one direction at a time. Look, when I hold my fist together, I'm using my muscles upward and downward. I have no sideward power. That's the secret. If you are so dad blame smart, let's see you magnetize yourself to the floor like I did. Mr. Chatterton. What's holding you down? He shifted his elbow slightly backward. That throws his center of gravity forward. It keeps his body from being balanced at the elbows, deflecting the force of your lift. Watch what happens when he pulls his elbows in a little at his center of gravity. Can you beat that? We read up on these tricks in the same book she must have. Only the real little Georgia Magnet didn't peddle mumbo-jumbo water for $100 a bottle. That get-rich-quick swindle is strictly Detroit Dollies. Is that who you are? Goodness me? No. You can drop the phony southern accent. And hand back my check. Uh, the police will be needing that for evidence. What police? Hello, Dolly. I just got an earful. I heard you were back in town. Rotten kids! Who are you? The Bloodhound Gang. Super emo. Okay, this is the best joke. This is really good. Where does a 10,000 pound elephant go? Anywhere he wants. 321 Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop.